Hello, I'm Professor Adam Thompson, and this is the presentation on dysrhythmia management. And within this presentation, we're going to talk about treating both uh, bradycardic uh, dysrhythmias and tachycardic dysrhythmias. And we're going to use the American Heart Association's recommendations and guidelines uh, to do so. This is not sponsored by the AHA, and this cannot replace uh, the American Heart Association's uh, ACLS course. However, you may supplement the ACLS course according to their program manual uh, only after all of the required information has been delivered. You know, since 1980, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association have translated scientific evidence into clinical practice guidelines with recommendations to improve cardiovascular health. These guidelines, which are based on systematic methods to evaluate and classify evidence, provide a cornerstone for quality cardiovascular care. The ACC and the AHA both sponsor the development and publication of guidelines without uh, any commercial support, and members of each organization volunteer their time to the writing and review efforts. Uh, guidelines are official policy of the ACC and the AHA. And I, I kind of wanted to say all of that because that is the stance from the AHA. That's the preamble uh, in circulation uh, before they provide any of their guidelines. So first, we're going to talk about uh, Brady dysrhythmias or bradycardias. And specifically, we're going to manage bradycardias uh, when they're usually below a heart rate of 50. I know any, any rate below 60 is considered bradycardic, uh, but when they become below 50 is typically when you're going to start management. And even then, you only begin management when they're symptomatic. Not unstable, that's a common misnomer, but symptomatic, meaning they have symptoms associated to the low heart rate. So how would you treat this bradycardic rhythm? You can quickly assess uh, the rate if you were, uh, you know, identifying this as a six-second strip. Five, six, and you have one, two, three, four QRS complexes. If you have pulses associated with that, that would be a, a pulse rate of 40, right? Because you take the number of QRS complexes and multiply it by 10 when you have a six-second strip. Um, and we might be able to identify this rhythm since we see there are P waves here. And these P waves are probably one right about there. These P waves are not correlated to the QRS complexes. You have complete AV disassociation. And we know that to be a complete heart block or a third degree AV block. The worst of the AV blocks, right? Uh, so how would you go about treating this rhythm? What might work versus what might not work in the bradycardic algorithm? So here is the most up-to-date uh, bradycardic al algorithm from the American Heart Association. Um, and again, it kind of reminds you that most uh, brady dysrhythmias are, are, that need to be treated are those that are below a heart rate of 50. Um, and again, it's going to be symptomatic bradycardias. So, of course, they provide you with kind of the uh, supportive care of maintaining a uh, patent airway uh, and assist breathing as necessary, provide oxygen if they're hypoxemic. Of course, you're going to want to put them on a monitor. You want to identify the heart rhythm, monitor their blood pressure and all of their vital signs, really. Uh, and then you're going to want to establish IV access. And remember, so oxygen might be your first medication that you deliver, but what's not mentioned on here is fluids. And you're going to want to administer fluids to stimulate what's called the Bainbridge reflex, which simply means if you give more volume, you can get more heart rate. Uh, what, what happens is your atria have stretch receptors, and as you fill that uh, atrium up, the right atrium, uh, with volume, with preload, uh, the heart will say, oh, we need to increase our rate. It, and it may work to increase your patient's heart rate without any other medications needing to be given. So try to stimulate that Bainbridge reflex. <clears throat> so then you're going to ask, after you get your 12 lead, uh, is your patient symptomatic? So do they have hypotension? Uh, acutely altered mental status, signs of shock, ischemic chest discomfort, or heart failure. If not, you're just simply going to provide supportive care. You're going to monitor them and observe them. Uh, but if they do, or any other uh, 
clinically significant sign or symptom associated to the bradycardia. It might not be listed here, but if they had something else that might be associated to the bradycardia, you're going to want to move down the treatment algorithm. And the first treatment, no matter what the bradycardia that you see here, is atropine. And our dose for atropine, it's right over here. It's uh, 0 0.5 milligrams bolus. You want to give that pretty fast. What happens is, uh, is atropine is an anticholinergic, and meaning it's going to find those acetylcholine receptors, and it's going to try to fill them in. And if you give atropine too slow, it'll start to fill in the receptors, but then the acetylcholine will rush in to fill them, and you'll get what's called a reflex bradycardia. And that's, of course, against what we're trying to do. So you want to give the atropine relatively fast. You don't want to give that slow. And as you see here, it says you can repeat that every three to five minutes to a maximum of three milligrams. The only time you're going to repeat your doses of atropine is if you give the atropine and it works, and then they become bradycardic again, go ahead and repeat the atropine. If you give atropine and it doesn't work or it, and doesn't do anything, um, then you're going to want to move down the treatment algorithm. Don't continue to give a treatment that was ineffective to its max dose. That doesn't make any sense. So if atropine is ineffective, then you're going to move down to one of these three options. You have transcutaneous pacing, dopamine, or epinephrine. And each one of them have their own benefits and or downfalls. For instance, transcutaneous benefit, uh, pacing has the benefit of being very fast, relatively effective, but the downfall is it causes pain. Um, you can get the, the pacer pads on a patient quicker than you can get an IV drip going. Um, and both these epinephrine and dopamine medications in this uh, uh, algorithm are infusions. So getting that transcutaneous pacing going pretty quickly on an unstable bradycardic patient may be what you want to do. And then... Um, provide some sedation or provide some sedation and then start transcutaneous pacing because again it is painful uh, dopamine dopamine has the benefit uh, especially if they're in a, a right ventricular failure or if they're in, in some sort of cardiogenic shock dopamine has the benefit of providing some pretty good inotropy it's actually the perfect medication for cardiogenic shock where epinephrine is has really good chronotropy right? It's really good at increasing the heart rate. However, it's going to increase oxygen demand. So if you had a patient that was experiencing a myocardial infarction and you give them an epinephrine infusion, uh, you may increase the size of that infarct because you're increasing oxygen demand. So you see all of these uh, options have their benefits and their downfalls, and some situations may call for one uh, more so than the other. If none of that works, then you're going to consider expert consultation and maybe even transvenous pacing once you uh, arrive at the hospital. Uh, there are conditions where none of these will work. One of those conditions uh, happens to be hyperkalemia. If you have a patient that's severely hyperkalemic, you're going to have a hard time uh, maintaining their heart rate if they are, in fact, bradycardic. Uh, these patients, sometimes they even have an implanted pacemaker, and that implanted pacemaker, without dislodgement, will lose capture. And you'll see the pacer spikes from their implanted pacemaker and something that looks like an idioventricular rhythm. That is, in fact, uh, a sine wave-like pattern that you can develop with severe hyperkalemia. Since we're talking about these bradycardias, we should sort of review the cardiac conduction system so we have an idea of certain medications that may be ineffective. So you saw that atropine was the first medication following oxygen and fluids that you're going to give every bradycardic patient. However, atropine might not be the most effective medication for certain uh, dysrhythmias, such as a complete heart block. The reason being is we know atropine is a, a parasympathetic blocker. It's called an anticholinergic or parasympatholytic. Whatever uh, term you'd like to use, it blocks the parasympathetic nervous system, blocking acetylcholine. And that works on the vagus nerve, right? And we know the vagus nerve innervates, to a large degree, the atrium. So the vagus nerve innervates this area, right? Uh, to a much lesser degree, uh, the ventricles are innervated by, by the uh, vagus nerve. So the atria, the AV junctional area, 
all innervated by the vagus nerve, not so much the ventricles. And that's where our atropine works. So if you have a complete uh, heart block or a third degree AV block where the signal may arise in the SA node and the atria are depolarizing, but there is a complete blockage here at the AV junction. I'll use a different color here. There's a complete blockage here. Then you may not get any of an increased ventricular rate because this is where our, our actual heart rate is being paced from. You may not get an increased ventricular rate from atropine. You might may see... Uh, what's common is you'll see an increased rate of P waves. Uh, however, the QRSs are in a, unaffected from the uh, atropine dosage. And that's simply telling you that the atropine worked on the atria, but that's not what provides you with a pulse, right? You need that ventricular depolarization to increase as well. So you may need to move past atropine relatively quickly with your higher grade AV blocks. Keep that in mind. It doesn't mean to forego the atropine. However, severely unstable patient, you don't have an IV line yet, you may forego it and put a pacemaker on them, right? But in your, in your typical symptomatic bradycardic patient with a high-grade AV block, you're going to at least attempt one dose of atropine before moving on to pacing dopamine or an epinephrine infusion. I mentioned the Bainbridge reflex. Remember when you're treating these patients, uh, treating all dysrhythmias, less is more. So if you can treat a patient with fluids alone and take away their symptoms and increase their perfusion state and improve their vital signs, then you've kind of reached the gold standard of therapy. So this is how the Bainbridge reflex works. Increase vascular volume, which we can provide, right, by uh, IV. So we give some IV ringers or normal saline and increase their vascular volume, which is going to stimulate the atrial stretch receptors and the medullary activation. Uh, via the vagus nerve, and then they're going to get an increased sympathetic activity, which in turn increases the heart rate. So basically, in layman's terms, the heart identifies that there's a lot more volume coming in and that it wants to get rid of that volume and get it out into the body, so it increases its heart rate. It's much like the Frank Starling mechanism, where the, the heart will stretch more and then increase its cardiac output because of the, the larger amount of volume coming in, uh, through through that, I guess, stronger beat, that more inotropic beat. Uh, in this sense, it's the chronotropy. So uh, the, the heart says, let's increase our rate of speed because of all this increased volume coming in. You're going to want to be careful, though, because some of these bradycardic patients are experiencing heart failure and uh, some uh, pulmonary congestion. So you don't want to increase the amount of fluid in the lungs through way of uh, third spacing. So make sure you're auscultating their lung sounds and, and, and doing a good set of vital signs before giving them too large of a fluid challenge. So let's talk for a second about transcutaneous pacing because amongst many providers, it's believed that transcutaneous pacing may be ineffective or not great. However, some providers may think that it's uh, a, a really great treatment, but they're not performing it well. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people are not taught you know, at the early stages uh, of their, you know, clinical preceptorship, how to actually provide adequate transcutaneous pacing. And if you look here, uh, th- now this isn't going to show the rhythm nice and clean like a, a regular rhythm strip. This is from uh, the Zoll M series rescue net. However, you can get the idea here. If we look at this first circle, what you see is this first beat is captured. The second beat is not, and the third beat is not within that circle. Well, what's different about those? Obviously, you see with the first beat, you see a spike, a QRS, and a T wave. You need those three components for good electrical capture. In the second beat, you see a spike, you see what you think might be a QRS, no T wave. Same thing with the third beat, no T wave. You can't have depolarization without repolarization. If you look at a membrane action potential and how it works, you need that potassium washout to repolarize the myocyte so it can then depolarize. And without getting down to the cellular level too much, basically you need to see a QRS and a T wave. Um, this, that l- what looks like a QRS here, let me draw an arrow just to this. 
That right there, which looks like a QRS, may be artifact from muscular twitching because it's being stimulated via the pacemaker. Um, and it will be rhythmic, and it may even feel like there's a pulse because the patient will move with that pacemaker. Uh, it could just be electrical artifact from the pacemaker itself. But it's not. What it is not is ventricular depolarization. And this is a common mistake where people will see these spikes, they'll see what looks like a QRS after, and they think they have full ventricular electrical capture, and they do not. Um, and uh, and that, that is a problem. You, you typically will not receive uh, electrical capture prior to 60 milliamps. Now, you could see here this, this monitor was set to 88 milliamps, so they got past that 60, 60 milliamperage. You're also going to want to improve your pad contact, so make sure you're doing an anterior-posterior pad placement, so you're sort of skewering that heart in between the two pads. Um, and by doing that and making sure the heart is you know, directly in between both of the pacer pads, you're really going to improve your chances of, of getting capture. Now, if you look here on the bottom, this circle ha both has uh, two capture beats. You see the spike, QRS, T-wave. Spike, QRS, T-wave. And that's exactly what you should see. Now, you do see here there's a QRS and a T-wave, but there's no spike before it. That's because this pa pacemaker is in a demand mode right, where it'll allow the body's intrinsic beats to supplement the the uh, exogenous beats, if you will, the transcutaneous beats that we're actually doing. So the paste rate will be set to something like 60, uh, and if the underlying heart rate w beats within that, then the pacemaker will just supplement that underlying heart rate to maintain a rate of around 60, if that makes any sense. Here's a rhythm strip to kind of show you what it looks like in real time if you're printing out your EKG strip. So this red box shows you full electrical capture. This blue box here uh, shows you no electrical capture. That, in fact, is just a spike and the artifact following the spike without a T-wave. There is no uh, ventricular repolarization. In fact, one way I can prove this is right here. You don't have uh, capture, but you have the intrinsic beat. And that intrinsic beat is actually occurring almost on the absolute refractory period where it could not possibly occur um, if you did, in fact, have uh, ventricular capture or electrical capture. So, so that beat right there, that's the body's actual intrinsic QRS. It's, it happens here again where you do not have electrical capture. The body still has an underlying heart rate, albeit a very slow one. That's a very slow heart rate. Um, but you could still see it through the pacemaker, letting you know that this is not obtaining full electrical capture. Next, we're going to talk about tachydysrhythmias. Now, we know tachydysrhythmias are tachycardias, but we typically don't treat the tachycardias till we break that kind of close to 150 range. I don't want to say that's a hard, fast rule, um, because it's often been taught that you don't have an SVT rhythm unless the rate equals 150 or more. That's not true. That's, that's, that doesn't make any sense physiologically. Uh, however, that rate is typically where patients may start having um, some hypoperfusion or symptoms related to uh, the, the rapid ventricular response. So how would you treat this tachycardia? Um, you could see it's pretty fast. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 QRS complexes, making it a rate close to 160. And if you know how to do the big box method, you see there's a solid line here and a solid line here. So you could see it's just past uh, or just faster than 150 beats per minute. So it is probably around 160. It's wide, and there's no discernible P waves. So this is, this is a wide complex tachycardia, or a WCT, and most likely it's a ventricular tachycardia. That's what you should assume with all your wide co complex tachycardias, especially when they're very regular like this one is. So how would you treat this, this patient? How would you treat this patient? Now this patient looks to have an even faster rate. Uh, this rate's even faster, you feel free to count it out, and it's narrow. So is it worse? Is it better? Would this patient be sicker? 
Or would they be not as sick because they have a narrow complex versus the wide complex tachycardia? Now this one we would probably call an SVT or supraventricular tachycardia. And that's not typically a diagnosed rhythm. That's not a, you know, it's a global term, supraventricular tachycardia. And sinus tach kind of fits into that. However, when, when we're typically talking about SVT, we're talking about AV or atrioventricular reentry tachycardia or AVN, excuse me, AV nodal reentry tachycardia. Those are the two uh, tachycardias that we're typically talking about with SVT because they're both reentry tachycardias and they're both treated uh, very similarly. What about this tachycardia? This one, it's faster at times and slower at other times. Uh, it's narrow, it's irregular. Obviously, this is a atrial fibrillation or an AFib. And when it's fast like this, we call it AFib with RVR. And I didn't make that lowercase i for any specific reason. Uh, AFib with RVR, or a rapid ventricular response. And this is also a different rate for different people, but again, as you approach that rate of about 150, albeit on the monitor, the rate's not going to be consistently anything. It's going to be bouncing around, and that's one great way to diagnose AFib. As this gets faster and faster, it's hard to differentiate atrial fibrillation from SVT. Um, and one way that I commonly teach to differentiate it is to look at the heart monitor. And if you see that heart rate jumping around plus or minus 10 beats per minute, you're probably dealing with AFib because SVT stays very regular, whereas we know AFib has no regularity to it. So here's the algorithm from the American Heart Association. And you could see here they kind of mention what I'm talking about, that it's usually going to be a heart rate you know, equal to or greater than 150. That 150 mark is interesting because that's right about where every one of your 2 to 1 atrial flutters is going to be. Uh, atri uh, you, you, when you have an atrial fl flutter rhythm, that atrial rate is typically right around 300 beats per minute, you know, 290 to 300 beats per minute. So when you cut that in half and you have every two flutter beats, you know, uh, will conduct a QRS complex and you have a two to one flutter, it's like right about 150 every time. Okay, uh, so we're going to start with that. We got a patient that's tachycardic and then we're going to move down, start providing supportive care just like we do with the bradycardic algorithm. Uh, give them oxygen if they're hypoxemic, position them, maintain a good airway, put them on a cardiac monitor, identify the rhythm, and of course monitor all of their vital signs. Then you're going to ask those same questions. And what we're asking here is, are they stable or unstable? Because what makes things really easy is if these patients are unstable, the therapy is the same. No matter what rhythm they are in, the therapy is uh, the same. However, you may change the dose. And I'll talk about that in a second. So do they have hypotension, an acutely altered mental state, signs of shock, ischemic chest discomfort, acute heart failure, such as uh, pulmonary congestion or anything like that. If they do, then you can move directly over here to the, un, uh, the, the uh, unstable side, where we talk about synchronized cardioversion. Synchronized cardioversion is cardioversion that is synchronized to the R wave or the, the deepest S wave, depending on uh, the axis of the rhythm you're looking at. The monitor will synchronize to that QRS complex and provide a very synchronized defibrillation, as opposed to manual defibrillation performed during cardiac arrest. You're going to want to make sure you, you, know, you hit that sync button on your cardiac monitor prior to delivering any shock. And you're going to provide a certain dose depending on the presentation of the rhythm. So if it's narrow and regular, kind of like your SVT would be, you would provide a very small dose. Start close to 50 joules. And you can go up to 100 joules. If it's narrow and irregular, much like your atrial fibrillation without aberrancy, you're going to start much higher at 120 joules to 200 joules. And the reason is at rapid AFib, any AFib really, is very, very difficult to cardiovert. That rhythm is super stubborn. But keep in mind, you might not want to cardiovert this patient. If they are somebody that has chronic atrial fibrillation, and they're not 
you know, thrombolized or heparinized, you can dislodge a blood clot that's been building up in their atrium. And that blood clot can, you know, very quickly find its way to either the lungs or to the brain. And you could have uh, the patient with a pulmonary embolism or a stroke or very severe symptoms. So if you're shocking somebody in atrial fibrillation, you got to first uh, see if it's a chronic afibr or if it's somebody that just went into it. All atrial fibrillation patients that have chronic afib are on medications because that's the only way to keep the rate under control. Uh, the, with, with AFib, the atria are depolarizing close to 800 times a minute. And if uh, if you don't control that, a lot of those signals are going to make it to the ventricles and they're going to be fast. So they're always going to be on some sort of negative chronotrope like a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. And they're almost always going to be on some sort of blood thinner like warfarin, coumadin, uh, or clopidegrel, something like that. Okay, so find out if they have a history of it. If they do, then try to use other therapies. If, if they're unstable, though, and you think that the rhythm is the cause for that and you need to change it, there's, that's where you start, 120 joules with your synchronized cardioversion. If it's wide and regular, you're going to provide 100 joules. That's VTAC, your monomorphic VTAC. And notice that that's less than the AFib. It's easier to convert VTAC than it is AFib. And wide and irregular, you're going to just defibrillate it. Because it's going to be very hard for the monitor to synchronize to that. Um, this is much like your AFib with WPW. Now, I will say if somebody has AFib with WPW um, and they're preventing with that fast, broad, irregular rhythm, it's probably new. It's, there's almost no chance that they're in chronic AFib if they have WPW because their rate's going to be super fast and it's too fast to perfuse the body. That patient could be cardioverted or uh, defibrillated. And your torsades de point is going to be like a polymorphic VTAC. You're going to want to defibrillate that as well. If it's an unstable patient, if not, you're going to provide them with some magnesium sulfate. Uh, all right, so coming back over here. There is a consideration, if they're unstable, uh, for sedation, of course, provi before providing synchronized cardioversion. And if it's regular, if it's a regular uh, narrow complex tachycardia, you can also consider adenosine, okay? So uh, what they're saying is if you have an unstable patient that's an SVT and you have quick access to an IV and you have your adenosine there ready to go, you can administer adenosine prior to cardioverting them because adenosine is so effective in those SVT patients. So don't look at cardioversion as a, as a dangerous thing for most patients. It's pretty pretty benign, even though it causes pain. Uh, it's not cardiotoxic like all these medications. You know, when you talk about giving antidysrhythmics, all of them work sort of by poisoning the body in a way. They kind of uh, close off these uh, electrolyte channels, and that can cause uh, all kinds of other issues down the, down the road. So cardioversion is probably the least, uh, you know, least... Uh, it's very effective, and it's the least harmful therapy down the road, if that makes any sense. Okay, so coming back over here, if they are stable, so if you ask all these questions and none of them exist, then you're going to check to see, is the QRS complex wide or narrow? Are you dealing with a wide complex tachycardia or a narrow complex tachycardia? And if it's wide, you're going to come over here, you're going to get your IV access, 12 lead if available, Consider adenosine, again, if it's regular and monomorphic, because A, this could be an SVT with aberrancy, so that would be like your AV nodal reentry tachycardia that also has a left bundle branch block or a right bundle branch block, and if it did, that adenosine is going to be pretty, uh, pretty effective, and what's great about adenosine is the body metabolizes it right up, and you give it, it works, stops the heart, and when it's the right rhythm, it'll cease the rhythm pretty quickly and effectively. Consider antiarrhythmic infusion. So that would be something like amiodarone or lidocaine or procainamide amiodarone right here, probably the most common one right now. For these patients that have a pulse, you're going to put 150 milligrams of amiodarone into a 100cc bag of D5W and administer that over 10 minutes. That's your loading dose for amiodarone. And the only reason you're giving it slow over 10 minutes is because it drops the blood pressure. So if you gave it uh, too fast to somebody that has a pulse, you can take away their blood pressure. 
So that's your treatment for wide complex tachycardia. Again, you could consider adenosine if it's monomorphic, if it's regular, but quickly be ready to move on to amiodarone, especially if you think it's a ventricular tachycardia. Now coming back, let me get rid of some of this. Let me get rid of some of this over here. Got all these arrows pointing everywhere. All right, so coming back over here to where we're asking ourselves is if it's wide or narrow. So when if it's wide, you go over here to the amiodarone. If it's narrow, you come down here. And now you want to try to identify the rhythm. So get your IV access, get your 12 lead, of course. And you can attempt vagal maneuvers on all narrow uh, dysrhythmias. Uh, vagal maneuvers are pretty effective on patients that have, uh, you know, your SVTs, if you could break it. If, I will say, if you break the SVT, you know, if somebody's in SVT and you break the rhythm with vagal maneuvers and then that SVT comes back, you can now call that a refractory SVT, and I would skip adenosine and go right to a calcium channel blocker. And the reason being is adenosine is just going to do that very same thing. You're going to break the rhythm for a very short period of time, and then it's going to recur as soon as that adenosine wears off. Remember, it's got about a 10-second half-life, so it's not in the body very long. Uh, so if vagal maneuvers are ineffective, if they do nothing, and it's an SVT, you're going to want to go ahead and administer adenosine. And your dose for adenosine is right here, 6 milligrams. You want to have a nice proximal line, maybe like an antecubital vein. Uh, provide that really fast when pinch, while pinching the line. Then follow it up with a nice, large, normal saline flush. You could follow up that dose with a second dose if, it, if it's ineffective, and you could do it relatively quick. So after you give the 6 milligrams, hit print on your monitor. Watch. Uh, if nothing happens within 10 seconds, prepare your second dose of adenosine. However, if you give the 6 milligrams and you see that brief asystole, but you see maybe flutter waves, then you know you have an atrial flutter instead of an SVT, and you're going to want to change your treatment. Okay, so that's another great thing about adenosine is you can see the underlying rhythm sometimes uh, when you may think it's an SVT, and it's not. So if 6 milligrams in true SVT does not work, you move on to the 12 milligrams. And some patients will even tell you uh, that 12 milligrams is the only thing that works for them. So uh, you, you may want to take their advice and go right to the 12 milligrams. There's no sense of making them have that feeling twice because you're actually stopping cardiac conduction, which makes them feel like that sense of impending doom. Coming back over here to your narrow complex stable tachycardias. Narrow complex stable tachycardias. Uh, so if it's an irregular rhythm like it is with atrial fibrillation, or if you can identify flutter waves, or if maybe it's a multifocal atrial tachycardia and they're, and they're pretty symptomatic, all of these you can consider calcium channel blockers, like Cardizem. Okay, and Cardizem is great for these narrow complex irregular rhythms or refractory uh, SVT. It's never a good choice for a wide rhythm, because if you give Cardizem inadvertently to somebody that has a Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, or a ventricular arrhythmia, uh, you could put them into ventricular fibrillation, and it's going to be very refractory. It could be very difficult to treat that patient. However, AFib, A flutter, refractory SVT, great choice. Uh, Cardizem, and your dose for Cardizem is 0 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. Max dose for your first dose is going to be 20 milligrams. You want to give that nice and slow over about two minutes because it lowers the blood pressure. So make sure your IV line is running wide open as you administer that medication nice and slow. Um, if it, once it wears off, you can give another uh, uh, 0.20 milligrams per kilogram, max dose 25 milligrams. Excuse me, I don't know why I said 0.20, it's 0 0.35. 0 0.35 milligrams per kilogram. 0 0.35 milligrams per kilogram, max of 25 milligrams for your second dose. Um, so that's going to be your cardizem for your atrial fibrillations and your atrial flutters. I talked briefly about vagal maneuvers. Some of the vagal maneuvers you may have heard of are, you know, ocular pressure, carotid massage. Neither one of those are great pre-hospitally because they have um, other issues that you can cause. However, uh, Valsalva maneuver is a good one where you have the patient bear down and try to build up the pressure in their intrathoracic and intra-abdominal cavities because that will uh, 
cause the parasympathetic nervous system to try to kick in and slow down the heart rate by way of the vagus nerve. Um, quite recently, they did something called the REVERT trial, where you had a patient blow into a syringe, okay? Uh, they would blow into a syringe first, trying to push that plunger back, and then you would actually invert the patient. You, you would take the patient from a high Fowler's position, put their back down, and then raise their legs. So, you, you know, you're not really inverting them into, like, head-down position, but you are uh, supinating them and then kind of trindling them pretty quickly. Uh, so that has been very effective at treating SVT. Uh, that revert vagal maneuver is extremely effective, and I highly recommend it. So here's another tachycardia that we didn't really talk about too much. Uh, this is a sinus tachycardia, and you know it is because of those P waves, consistent PR interval, rate faster than 100, narrow QRS complex, everything you need to make it a sinus tach. And for all intents and purposes... In your mind, you should look at all sinus tachycardias as compensatory until proven otherwise. In fact, you should look at every reentry tachycardia that you treat outside of your ventricular arrhythmias um, as a secondary reentry tachycardia to a compensatory tachycardia because that often does happen where somebody will be compensating um, and then they go into a reentry. So provide fluids. All of your sinus tachs, the only medication you should get to. Um, beyond oxygen is uh, fluids, you know, provide a fluid challenge. We talked briefly about some of the antiarrhythmic drugs, and what's important to note is that each antidysrhythmic medication works differently due to its effect on the channels of the myocyte. Uh, so you have a sodium blockers, which are all your class 1 antiarrhythmics, and even within those you have subcategories, 1A, 1B, 1C. And they're very effective. They prolong phase zero, which is ventricular depolarization. And by prolonging that, you get a wider QRS complex. Lidocaine is probably the most common. And uh, procainamide is probably the second most common. Your class two are your ad adrenergic beta-1 receptor blockers. Okay, they, your beta blockers, and these are all your laws. So you've heard of all these, right? Like metaprolol, atenolol, uh, esmolol. And they work by blocking the sympathetic nervous system, the receptors of the sympathetic nervous system, uh, which, of course, uh, is where we get a lot of our heart rate, right? The, the adrenaline, the adrenergic nervous system. And then class three are potassium channel blockers, and amiodarone is definitely... The, the most commonly known of the bunch, probably the most famous, and it's become infamous. Amiodarone actually is a class 1, class 2, class 3, and I think even somewhat of a class 4 uh, antidysrhythmic. It's, you know, largest property, sure, is potassium channel blocking. Uh, however, it does block sodium channels, will block uh, calcium channels. Um, I don't know if it's much of a beta blocker, but that's how you should look at it. It is a non-selective cardiotoxin. Uh, it does not care what it's blocking. That's, it does, that's why it works for atrial and ventricular dysrhythmias. And that's why so much money was put into it. Uh, and so much support was given to it when it first came out. Um, and it, it is effective at, at slowing down atrial and ventricular dysrhythmias. And then your class 4, that's your uh, calcium channel blockers such as cardizem and verapamil. Uh, so now you understand the, each one of those, by blocking different you know, ion channels, is going to cause changes in those different phases of the membrane action potential. It can cause widening of the QRS, prolongation of the QT interval. Uh, amiodarone is really you know, uh, known for prolonging that QT interval, which puts the patient at higher risk of torsades. So you wouldn't want to use amiodarone uh, obviously, if you knew the patient had torsades. So again, breaking down your different treatments. If you have a stable SVT, try vagal maneuvers, fluids, adenosine. If adenosine doesn't work, the refractory to it, cardizem. For AFib and, and, and uh, flutter with RVR that is stable, you're going to want to assess their history, 
uh, provide fluids and administer cardizem. For stable VTAC fluids, remember you can also consider you can consider adenosine and then move to amiodarone and cardioversion eventually if that doesn't work. And then unstable tachycardia, you know, we're not really specifying. You can consider adenosine, of course, consider sedation and provide synchronized cardioversion. And that pretty much covers uh, this course on uh, dysrhythmia management.